Hello, everyone, and welcome to our recorded lecture for Thanksgiving break. I hope everyone is being safe in their travels and is enjoying their break thus far. We're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off at the end of our last lecture. We're going to wrap up heaps, and if we have a little bit of time, we're going to talk about hash tables and the upcoming hash project. And at the end of our last lecture, we discussed the idea of well, first we analyzed the complexities of the insert and remove operations on a binary heap. And we can see here from our analysis that in the worst case, each of these operations were logarithmic in time. Then at the end of our last lecture, we discussed the idea of performing a lazy insert, right, where a lazy insert would take a constant amount of time. And we wondered, well, why would we do this? And a lazy insert would not necessarily uphold the heap priority uh, excuse me, the heap order property. Right. But if we were to construct a method called heapify or fix heap, right, that could fix our heap, and we could do that in a reasonable amount of time, it may be efficient in the long run. Right? And that is what we found out to be. And it, during our lecture, right, so we, we went over this one example here where we did our lazy inserts, Right, and here is some example here. Let me pull up my pen. All right. right. And so here is an example here where we were going to insert a 12, right, a 33, right, and a 31. That's not showing up very well. Let's see here. All right. Let's try that again. Right, a 12, right, a 33, and a 31. Right, and so here we can just see that we have the 12, right, the 33, and then the 31 placed in the leftmost position at the maximum depth of our heap. All right, after doing these toss-ins, however, we note that our heap priority or the heap property is not upheld, right? For example, 89 is higher than 31, right, and 36 is greater than 33, so this assumedly is a min heap, right? And so the minimum value indicates a higher priority and we have violations here from these inserts. And so how can we remedy this? Well, we can call our fix heap function. All right, in our lecture, this example was incomplete. I've completed this example, right? And I've added a few slides. So I want you guys to go ahead and check those out. Please go to Blackboard and download the updated version of these slides that has the complete version of this example and an explanation as to the time complexity of fix heap, aka heapify. Right, to start our, our heapify or our fix heap, note that we can start this iteration at the current size divided by two. Right, this will always get us to the first parent child in a reverse breadth first scan. Right, I encourage you to convince yourself that that is the case. Right, given our ordering and the depth and balance constraints imposed on the heap, that will be true. Right, starting our iteration at this particular node, we then simply check that node's child to see if a swap needs to be performed. If so, then we perform a swap. And so here we will swap 31 and 89. Right, and then we will traverse to the next node in a reverse breadth first scan. And so here we can see that we've successfully performed the swap. And then we will iterate to the 36. And 36 now will need to be swapped with one of its children, again, to uphold the heap priority or the heap order property. Right, which one to swap with here? And again, if we want to uphold the heap property, it's best to swap with the minimum value or the value with the highest priority. And so we swap with the 12. Right, at this point, we will iterate back over from the 12 to the 38. Right, note that 38, 46, and 68, right, 38 is in a proper order. Right, there's no violation here, so we continue our iteration and go back to 25. Right here at 25, right, we see that there is no violation, right, so we can continue on to 35. Right here at 35, there is a violation here. Right, and so we have a 12 and a 35. So here we need to perform a swap. Right, no violation here. But here with the 12 and the 35, we have a violation. 
right? So we perform the swap down operation. And when we do that, note, I believe it was uh, Grayson who noted this in class, that after performing one swap here, we don't complete, right? Or we haven't necessarily upheld the heap order property, right? After performing the swap, for example, 35 and 33 are out of order, right? right? The swap down function, of course, will continuously swap down, right? So subsequent swap will be performed here, 33 and 35 will be swapped, right? After this, right, the 12 is, right, at this node here, 33 and 35, right? The subtree of 12 is in the heap order property, right? Or it is uh, properly upheld, right? Next, our iterator halves itself yet again. We are at the root node now, 24. 24 is in violation of the heap order property, so we swap with 12, right? Thus ending, right, our fix heap, aka heapify operation. Right. Now we note here that we had an instance where we had to perform two swaps, that is swap down had to do two subsequent swaps Right. Thus, in the worst case, and we've already convinced ourselves of this, that swap down in the worst case will result in big O of log n swaps, the height of the tree. Therefore, seemingly that fix heap, right, aka heapify, will also right, will perform in the worst case in log n number of operations. Why? Because we're doing a reverse breadth first search, right, starting at the n over second node. Right, and iteratively traversing, so it has n over two or a linear number of traversal steps. And each one of those traversal steps is seemingly, in the worst case, log of n. Right? And that is true, and we could upper bound this operation, heapify, by big O of log of n. And however, we can find a tighter upper bound than this. Right? In fact, it is the case right, that we will not reach the worst case number of swaps for each of those swap downs. Right? The reason for this, intuitively, is simply that we start our iteration at n over two, that is we don't have to perform any of the swaps at maximum depth. At the first depth, or at the, uh, the first height, I should say, going up the tree, right, we can perform a maximum of only one swap, right? and then the next height up, right, we can form, uh, perform a maximum of two swaps, right? and on and on and on. Right? So in actuality, we can bound this linearly, right? that is, performing swap down within the context of a reverse breadth first search, that is, aka fix heap, right? We will perform at maximum linear number of swaps, total, right? So in total, this will be big O of N, right? And we will go over some more intuition as to why this is the case, right? Again, intuitively and upon first inspection, we can pretty easily convince ourselves that the total number of swaps during this breadth first search Right, this reverse breadth first search is going to be n log n, upper bounded by n log n, and that is an upper bound, but we can actually provide a tighter upper bound. That is, we can say that the total number of swaps right, is actually just going to be big O of n. Right. So how can we bound this? Well, again, note that we're not going to perform any swaps here at the bottom level, so that's already half of the nodes, in, or upwards of half of the nodes in our heap. Right. And note that all of the nodes on this first height here, right, at height number one, Right, can only be swapped a maximum of one time. Right? All of the nodes here can be swapped at a maximum of two time. Right? And also note, as we go up the tree, although the number of potential swaps increases, the number of nodes to be swapped is decreasing. Right? In fact, it's being halved. Right? So given this, and given this decrease of nodes that are going to have a potential increase of number of swaps, right? this actually telescopes, if you, if you do a, a sum of all possible swaps here, it will telescope down to just a linear number of total swaps. Right. How can we do this? How can we convince ourselves of this? Well, all we need to do to determine how many potential swaps we will perform right, in our fix heap or heapify function is simply to sum up the height of all of the nodes in our heap. Right. I'll say that again, we'll go back to the picture here. Right. How many swaps can we perform in this heap at a maximum? Right. How many operations? Well, it's simple. It's simply the height of each of the nodes. Right. So starting here, for example, at 31, what's the height of this node? Its height is 1. Right. Therefore, at maximum, we could do one swap with 31. Similarly here with 33. What is the height of 33? 
and its height is one. How many swaps can we perform with 33? Well, we can only swap it down once. Right? Similarly, up here with 12. Right? What is the height of 12? It's one, two, three. How many times can we swap 12 down? Well, just three times. Right? Therefore, we can bound the number of swaps total in this fixed heap function with the height, simply summing the heights of all of the nodes. Right? So that is the proof idea. Right, I provide a mathematical proof here, right, showing that we can upper bound this linearly. Right, you could also prove this by induction. I encourage you to do so. And um, for those of you who are more of a visual learner, I believe he, uh, Weiss provides a sort of a diagrammatic proof of this concept. Right, but here we'll just simply step through it mathematically. Right, so here we'll just simply show that the sum of all the heights, right, of the nodes, right, in our heap is linear. Right, so, and along these lines, we'll simply note that the first node, right, the root node, will have a maximum height of log base 2 of n, given a, that we have a binary heap. Right, its children, which there will be two nodes, note here that the number of nodes is doubling as we go down in depth, will have a height of log base 2 of n minus 1. And continuing in this fashion, we can build a sum, or a summation equation. That is, the sum of the heights is simply equal to i starting at 0, summing up to the height of our tree, log base 2 of n, and you can simply take the number of nodes at that particular depth right, to the i, right, multiply it times the height, right, which is going to be log base 2 n minus i right, for each i, that is each depth of the tree. So for example, right, uh, or I'm sorry, for each height of the tree. Right. So for example, at i equals 0, this is the, height, the highest height of the tree. Right, or uh, I should say depth of the tree. Right. This is 2 to the 0, which is 1. We have one node there, which is the root node, right, at depth of 0 of our tree. Right. And what is the depth or the height of that particular node? Right. It is log base 2 of n minus 0, just simply log base 2 of n. Right. At the next depth, we'll have 2 to the 1 number of nodes, right, and its depth will be log base, or its height will be, excuse me, log base 2 n minus 1, right, and so on and so forth. And again, to simplify this, uh, to make this equation a little bit more concise, we can substitute in h, the height, for log base 2 of n, right, we'll replace it back at the end, right, so we can simplify our sum as follows, right, and then just writing this out to convince ourselves, again, that this makes sense, we can see here that we have 2dh times 0, right, and then 2dh minus 1 times 1, Right, plus, 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 all the way down to 2 to the 0 times h. Right here, note that we've simply reversed the, right, reversed the sum starting at h and going down to 0. All right. So, observing here that we have 2 to the h and each one of these products in this sum, we can simply pull out 2 to the h right, and replace it with Right, the resulting products of 2. Right, so here we have 2 to the h minus 1. This is simply 2 to the h times 2 to the minus 1. Right, and so on and so forth. So by pulling 2 to the h out, we simply are left with 0 plus 2 to the minus 1 times 1 plus 2 to the minus 2 times 2 plus all the way out to 2 to the minus h times h. Right, note here that 2 to the h right, is simply... Right, the number of nodes maximum in the tree, right, which is n, right? And the resulting sum here is the sum from i equals 0 to h of 2 to the i uh, d uh, under i, or i divided by 2 to the i. Note here that when this sum approaches infinity, that is when h approaches infinity, this sum approaches 2, or converges to 2. Therefore, in the worst case, this sum will equal 2, right? Otherwise, it will be less than 2. Right? So we can upper bound this by 2n. Note here, then, that the sum of the heights can be bounded linearly by n. So we've shown here that it can be bounded linearly by n that is less than or equal to 2n. Right? In fact, we could even bound it tighter than this, but this is sufficient to show that it is uh, linear. Right? That is, we could bound this, and in fact, the sum of heights is equal to n minus h. 
Right? I encourage you, if you wish, to convince yourselves of this. Try a few examples. Right? In our previous example, the sum of the heights is 9. Right? And we have 12 and minus 3. So, so, for example, if we were to sum the heights of all of these nodes, we'd have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? 0, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. So that's 3, right? And then plus 2, which would be plus 7. Uh, 3 plus 2, which is 5, plus 2, which is 7, right? And then plus 3, which would be 10, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? And so we'd get the sum of the heights, which is equal to, oh, I, did I count that wrong? I think I might have. All right, that should be 10, right? And so we get uh, n minus h, right? Which would be the number of nodes, Right, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? minus the height, which is 3, right? yields us 9. Right? So the sum of the heights, I think, should be 10 here. So this should be n minus h minus 1. Right? Sorry about that. All right, but again, we have a linear, a linear upper bound here. All right, so this is pretty cool. Again, this is a huge, a huge finding for this fixed heap or heap of 5 function in that although upon first inspection it seems that we are going to get a n log n time complexity, in actuality it is going to be linear. All right, so reinspecting our use of the heap. Right, so let's say that, for example, we wanted to build a heap from scratch and we wanted to perform in inserts. Right, how could we get this done? Well, we could repeatedly perform in inserts using the standard insert function, which assures the heap order property. The time complexity for that would be n log n, right? Because for each of the n items that we insert, we'll have to do potential log n number of swaps. All right. However, right. However, if we were to perform in toss ends, right, or lazy inserts, right, so that would simply be big O of n. And then let's say after n inserts, we performed fixed heap, which is also big O of n. Right? This overall time complexity would be big O of n. Right? So here we see the big benefit of using this lazy insert and heapify. Right? And that is we can build our heap in linear time rather than in log n time. It's one more operation. All right, and I'll go over this briefly because we previously discussed this. All right, it's one operation that is somewhat common in queues, not always, is to update the priority of an item already in the queue. Right. We can do this, right, assuming that we have a direct index to the item to be updated. We can do this in log n time. Right. How can we do this? Right. Using the pseudocode here, we see that we'll need an index into the heap for the item to be updated, the new value, right? Based on the new value, we can either swap that item up or swap that item down to maintain the heap order property, right? Again, since we'll either swap up or down, potentially up to the top or all the way down to a leaf node, the worst case time complexity will simply be logarithmic. Right, and we left off on this particular slide here where we discussed how we could use heaps for sorting, right? Again, one of the main results of our heap structure here is that we can heapify, right? Or fix the heap in linear time. This allows us to perform a fairly quick sort, right? We can't beat the removal time. The removal time in this particular situation is going to give us an right, in log n time, right? But it's still faster than many of the sorting algorithms that you guys have been exposed to uh, up to this point. All right, so the heap sort algorithm is simply as follows. Insert in items, right? That is build a heap. Using our lazy inserts, we can do this fairly quickly. We'll just simply toss in, in number of times, right? And then we can perform fix heap, which is also linear, right? But then here, when we remove the heap, we will, or when we remove the root node right, for the heap, we'll have to do a removal n times, right? And then to heapify or fix our broken heap at that point, right? We will have to swap down the whole 
at the top of our node. Right? This removal process is logarithmic. Right? Since we're going to do in removals, and each one of those removals is going to result in a logarithmic swap down, right? in the worst case, right? this will be in log n. Right? But the overall time complexity is going to be in log n, right? because we have big O of n plus big O of n plus big O of n log n, which simply yields big O of n log n. Right? Again, compared to some common sorting algorithms, that's not so bad, right? as insertion sort, bubble sort, and selection sort and are each quadratic in the worst case. Also note, and of some, some interest here, is that each of these sorting algorithms can be performed in place, or that is they can be implemented in place, and that is you don't need to have any extra memory right, that's gonna scale with respect to the size of the input, just a constant number of extra memory locations needed for iterators and maybe temporary variables, right? So each of these interestingly, can be implemented in a fairly space-efficient fashion. Right. Lastly, and this we did not get to discuss, so we will cover this new topic of merging heaps. It is often the case that heaps will need to be merged. Right. Uh, an example of this might be in a, com in a computer system. There might be a number of resources that are shared among entities. And for example, if one of these resources is removed or becomes uh, unusable, right? If there is a queue of items waiting for that particular entity, right? That queue will have to be merged in with some of the other queues so that the entities will not be left waiting forever. Instead, they'll just have to get in line at, with some of the other entities waiting for one of the other resources. Right? This could be accomplished by merging queues. Right? If these queues happen to be priority queues, then we would be merging priority queues or merging heaps. All right, given our implementation thus far, we've been able to take advantage of the fact that we've implemented these priority queues as heaps right, using arrays. Right? And the arrays allowed for a very streamlined, streamlined implementation. It right? allows for direct indexing, right? no unnecessary pointers, et cetera. Right? However, this is where that array implementation will not benefit us, right? Whenever we have to perform merging with heaps. Right. The reason for this is simply that if we want to integrate right, two sets or, or two arrays, right, that is merge items from two arrays, right, we will have to copy over items from one array to make room for items from the other array. Right, so at the very best case, you can see here, we'll be able to accomplish this in linear time, right, at best. And at the very least, we'll have to copy over items, even if they're already in order, right, it would still take linear time just to do the copy. And right, so even at best, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be uh, a linear time. Right, um, intuitively, we could do something as follows. Right, to create a new heap that is merging of two heaps, if we implemented them as arrays, we could simply concatenate the two heaps. That is, uh, if one of the heaps, for example, is larger than the other or has a larger maximum capacity, right, such that it could fit all of the elements in both heaps, we can just simply take the other heap, copy that, those items into the, uh, the heap with the extra maximum space, right, and then perform heapify or fix heap. Right, the copy would be linear and heapify would also be linear. Right, so what would that look like conceptually? Right, so here assume we have these two heaps. Right, we can simply concatenate these two, that is the heap rooted at 12. And we can simply take the first item in that array and copy it to the leftmost available space right, in our other heap. Right, so here, the leftmost space would be the left child of 35, then the right child of 35, then the left child of 25. Right, so uh, these items in heap order would be 12 followed by 36 and 33 right, in, in the array, I should say. Right, and so just copying them over and concatenating those two arrays, we would get a heap that looks like this. All right, from this point, we would then call heapify. And heapify will start at the first parent node which is, again, the number of items in the heap divided by two. And starting at 25, we check that the heap order property is upheld. It is. No need to swap. And so we 
increment, our iterator, to 35. The heap order property is not upheld here, so we perform a swap. And 12 gets swapped up, right? And now 35 is in heap order property. And so now we decrement our iterator again. We get to the root node 24. Right, 24 and 12 right, has a violation. We have a heap order violation. So we perform a swap. And now 12 is our proper root. And our heap is now in order. Right, again, the concept is pretty straightforward. Merging heaps, we want to merge the items in both heaps such that the heap order property is upheld in the resulting heap. Right, given our, our simple example here, we can see that there is a linear number of operations to be performed. Right? That is, we will have to merge the two heaps or uh, concatenate the two heaps in some fashion. Right? And then we will need to perform heapify. This is going to be on the order of the size of the first heap plus the size of the second heap right? or linear time, right? given that simple implementation. Can we do better? Certainly. Right, and in fact, we can do a lot better if we use an array implementation, or excuse me, if we use a chaining implementation. Right, that is, if we implemented the heaps not using an array, but rather using pointers, pointers and nodes. Right. All right, so how will we get this done? Well, quite simply, we'll use a standard binary tree node, right, that is a node with two pointers, one pointer to the left child, one pointer to the right child. Right. Furthermore, what else are we going to do? Right. We're going to relax the height constraint. And you think to yourself, really, is that such a good idea? Right. The answer is, yeah, kind of. It's, it's not a bad idea. Right. Uh, what we get here as a result is what's called a skew heap. Right. The, the resulting heap that we get is simply a uh, going to be a, a binary skew heap. And it's called a skew heap for the way that we are going to be performing the merges. Right. This skew heap has a, a number of pros and cons that, uh, that somewhat conflict with the array implementation of a binary heap. Right. But the pro for a skew heap is that we can perform merges really quickly. Right. So, a skew heap is simply a binary tree with heap order and no balance constraint. Right? And we will define a skew merging scheme, which we'll discuss on the next slide. The result, of course, given that we have no balance constraint, is that the worst case scenario is we're going to have linear depth. Right? However, as you remember from a couple of weeks back, that the average case depth is going to be logarithmic. So although the worst case is linear, we can still achieve logarithmic complexity in the average case. Right? So although we're giving up some time complexity here, some efficiency here, some you know, space efficiency as well with our array implementation, and right? although we're giving some of that up, right, we attain right, as a benefit an average logarithmic time for merging, which is something that we could not do with our array implementation. All right, so let's go ahead and investigate our skew heap. All right, so again, our implementation, we're going to, we're going to create this with a pointers. All right, so we'll have a node structure with a left child and a right child. Right. And let's assume that we have two heaps. How are we going to merge them? Well, simply using this scheme here, let's say we have one heap with rooted at R1 and another heap rooted at R2 we'll perform the following recursive merge operation on these two heaps. First, the base case is simply, if one of these trees is empty, we'll just simply return the other. All right, so again, we're in a merging process here. We're going to recursively merge trees and subtrees, right? And so the base case is gonna be when one of the trees is null, we're simply just gonna return the other one, right? Thus merging that one tree with the resulting merges of the other trees. Right. And then our recursive case. Right. Our recursive case is simply a swapping of children and then a, re a repeated recursive call to merge. And that's all we're doing here. Right. So the first step is simply to save the right child of the first heap. Right. Then to swap the right and left child of the first heap. By swap, I mean 
right? We're saving the right child, right? And so we're gonna make the left child the new right child, right? So in a sense, we've detached the right child and made the left child the new right child of our first heap. And then we'll make the left child of our first, of the uh, first heap the result of the merge of its old right child, Tim, and the second heap, right? Here we can look at the pseudocode, but I've prepared, uh, prepared an example, which is a little bit more illustrative and intuitive. So we'll go ahead and look at the example and then come back and look at the pseudocode. Right? So assume we have these two heaps here, one in light blue and one in dark blue. Right? Note that the heap order property is upheld in each. Right? So what's the first step? Well, it's important at this point that First, the root node with the highest priority is identified here, and that is the one with the 12, right? And so the first step, interestingly, here in our merge is to swap the left and right heaps here, make the, the second heap the first heap and the first heap the second heap. That is, we want 12 to be the root of our resulting merge. And so we do that by checking their priorities, and so we see that the 12 is higher. So we're going to perform the swap with 12 being the root and then make the recursive call. Right, so what do we do? Right, again, we take the right child, 35, and detach it from the heap, swap the left child, which is 36 here for the right child, right, and then call merge on the old right child, right, which was 33, and the second heap, right, which is rooted at 24. Right, so the result is this down here. Note again, the results, we have 12, and 12's right child right, was its old left child, 36 and 45, so that's what we see here. Right, and then we make 12's left child the result of the merge of its old right child, which was 33, and the other heap rooted at 24. Right. So I've sort of left this left child hanging here, right? It's just sort of attached there. It's waiting for the recursive function call of the merge of 33 and 24. Right, so it's unattached at this point, right? We're here in the pseudocode. Right, we're going to assign this attachment here as soon as the recursive function merge skew heap returns from the merging of these two heaps over here on the left. All right, so we're going to recursively go down this function call chain, and then we'll be able to attach these left children as we call back up or return back up that call chain. All right, so again here, now we have, we run merge 33, right, and 24. Right, 24 is the highest priority. Right, so we're gonna swap its left and right child in a sense. That is, we're gonna detach 25 and insert 35 as its right child, right? And then call merge on the resulting two heaps. So here we see that we have 24 and 35. That is, again, we made 24 as left child, 35 is now its new right child, right? And then 24 is old child, rooted at 25, Right, is now to be merged with 33 again. Right. Note here that 33 right, and 25 right, are in a sense out of order. That is, we want to perform the, uh, the swap on 25. Right? So we swap heap number one and heap number two. Thus, right, we put, this, is, uh, this just looks to be a repeat here. So, so we simply place 25 here in heap number one position and 33 here in heap number two position. And now we perform merge again, right? 25 has, has the highest priority, right? So we take its left child and make it its new right child. So 32 will be 25's new right child, right? And then we'll perform merge on 25's old right child, which is nothing, it's null. So we're gonna hit the base case here and 33. And so we're gonna try to merge 33 and null. Right, again, so here's 25 and 32, right? 25's left child is going to be the result of, right, the merging of null and 33, right? Note here that 24 is waiting for its assignment of its left child too, which is going to be the result of 25, 25's merge, right? And then 12 is also waiting for its left child assignment, which is going to be the result of 24's merge. All right, so what do we get when we merge 33 and null? Well, the base case is simply to return the tree that's not null. So we will return 33, right? So 33 is now going to be 25's left child, 
right? And so our resulting merge is here. We can now return from this merge call as well and attach to 24. And so 24's left child is going to be 25. And then 12's left child is going to be 24. The resulting heap, right, the resulting skew heap is here. Note that it is indeed in heap order. Right. And it's, it's not too badly balanced either. Right. And so, again, we're not assuring that there's going to be a logarithmic depth here. Right. But the average case will be logarithmic. Looking at the pseudocode here, right, these first two lines are simply the base case, right? If the root one for heap one is null, return root two, and vice versa. If root two is null, then return uh, root one. Else, right, we check our priority. If we'll assume that root one is going to be the one with the highest priority, right? If not, then we'll switch them. How do we switch them? We'll just call merge again. Right, merge skew heap again and switch the left and right, right the left and right nodes or the left uh, the first and second heaps all right if root one does have the highest priority then we simply right detach the right child make the left child the new right child and then merge the old right child and the second heap and that's it right I think it's pretty intuitive again when you step through this example Right, this particular piece of code. All right, so right, looking at the pseudocode, do some time complexity analysis. Right, we have two heaps. Right, we're going to go down the depth of the the heap. Right, we are doing swaps. Right, and merges at each step. Right, a constant number of operations at each step here. Right. How many recursive function calls are we going to have? That's going to be the length of the depth of the heap. Right. What is that going to be in the average case? We know from our study of binary search trees that in the average case, it is going to be logarithmic. Worst case will be linear, but average case will be logarithmic. All right. A few other notes and observations about skew heaps. Right. Since uh, skew heaps are not array implementations, where are they balanced their operations and their common operations ones that we had already discussed such as insert and removal etc are somewhat different as compared to the binary heap again our binary heap implementation and pseudocode was based on an array implementation again which was a good thing right because we gained a lot of uh, speed right and space efficiency as well right so is that going to be lost with this chaining implementation Right, the answer is no, not in the average case. Right, in the average case, each of these steps is going to be logarithmic. And in fact, we can use this merge operation right, to perform all of these operations. That is, to perform an insert, all we need to do is merge the node to be inserted with the heap itself, right, which is pretty cool. Similar with a remove. Right, how do we implement a remove? Right, we can simply Again, when you remove an item from a heap, it's going to be the old root that is removed. Right? So all you need to do is to merge the root's left child and the root's right child, thus removing the root node. Lastly, how do we update priority? Right? Again, all we need to do here, get, assuming that we have a direct index to the node in our heap, right? We can simply change the priority of that node, detach this node from its parent, and then merge those two subtrees. All right. All right so again, a pretty interesting trade-off here between our binary heaps implemented as arrays and our skew heaps. Right? Our binary heaps implemented as arrays were very efficient, very streamlined. Right? They allow for logarithmic complexities for inserts, removals, and updates. Right. And for building a heap, we can do a lazy insert and a heapify, right, which would be linear, which is not too bad either. Right. However, with our array implementation, performing a merge was not very efficient. 
However, we have SKU heaps, right, which are a chaining implementation of our binary heap right, with a relaxed height constraint. They allow for a more efficient merge operation. So if we, for example, knew that we were going to be performing multiple merges with the heaps, it might be a good idea to implement it as a skew heap. Right. This, of course, increased our worst case. That is, our worst case for depth was no longer logarithmic. However, the average case is still logarithmic, and we are able to do a merge in logarithmic time. All right. So again, before we move on, I want to just go back and re-emphasize the time complexity right, for our one example, which, which gave us a little bit of pause in our last lecture. Right, bounding heapify, right, again, in the worst case, doing a swap down is going to be logarithmic. However, within the context of doing a reverse breadth first search, right, given that we have a heap structure, right, the total number of swaps is indeed bounded linearly in the worst case. Right, again, we can show this mathematically as we did here. Right, that all we need to do is to sum the heights of each of the nodes in our tree. Right? And here, mathematically, we show that the sum of these heights is upper bounded by 2n, thus showing that it is linearly upper bounded, big O of n. All right. So with the remainder of our time, I want to talk a little bit about the hash project. So we're going to change gears here for a moment. Let's see here. All right, so we have our hash here. All right. So for your projects, you guys are going to be implementing a hash table right, for your dictionary, for your lexicon within your spell checking software infrastructure. And so in your previous project, you guys implemented this lexicon as a B tree, and you found that it gave you some speed, right, some computational uh, comple uh, computational complexity, right, efficiency increase, mm -hmm. as compared to your list structures. Right? I think you will find right, that your heap, or that your hash, excuse me, will also give you an increase in time complexity as compared to your B tree. Right, at least that will be the goal. Major things to consider right, are these concepts, the main concepts that we covered when we were discussing hashes. Number one, a universal hash right, is a great hash function right, that allows us to bound the number of collisions we would have, right, statistically speaking, right, in a uniform sense. Right, that is, the probability of a collision of any two keys is going to be bounded by 1 over m. And so finding a universal hash is nice in a sense in that it will allow us to right, bound the potential collisions. Right? Why is this important? Well, you could see in a good case, in a, in a very lucky case, you might just happen to pick a hash function that will be perfect off the bat, let's say. Right? However, in, in a not so perfect case, you could choose a hash function that would be pretty bad, lead to you know, a lot of collisions or potentially all collisions in the worst case. Right. So to alleviate the concern of having to choose right, this perfect hash function, right, you may need to, or one approach would be to randomize this selection. Again, maybe you don't have a lot of information about the keys, or maybe the set of all keys right, is very large, right, but the number of items you might be potentially inserting is small but you don't know exactly which items you're going to be inserting. So choosing a hash function, right, uh, in a deterministic sense is impractical, right? So in, so in these cases, using a random choice, right, is not a bad idea. It sort of, again, it uni uh, uniformly distributes your chances of a collision right? so that you shouldn't have too many collisions in any one spot. At least that's the idea here. Right. One of the randomizations we talked about was choosing this random matrix. Right. This is certainly a reasonable approach to build a random hash. 
And again, the idea here is to make the collisions uniform. And if you have too many collisions in one square, for example, let's say that you had, you're going to insert in items into your hash table, right? And then you have in over two collisions in one of the squares. Well, if you want to then search for each of those items in your overflow area, it's gonna take you potentially a linear amount of time to search, right? So again, we want to keep those collisions down. One way to do that, unless you can just pull a perfect hash function right out of a hat, right, is to try to uniformly distribute the collisions. Right, we also talked about another universal hashing scheme. Rather than building a whole matrix, a whole binary matrix, right, if you have the ability to represent your keys as a vector of numbers, vector of ints, right, you can use right, a random vector of numbers, or ints, right, where each of these ints right, is bounded by uh, M, the size of your hash table, right, thus computing the key by summing up these random numbers times each of the entries in your vector, right, such that they are um, uh, for all k entries for a k length vector, right, and then take its modulus m. Right. The result will be an index value, which is between 0 and m minus 1, which is, of course, intuitively, a perfect index into right, a hash table of size m. Again, this randomizes this selection. How do you choose a hash function like this? Right? You just simply, with a random number generator, select some k random integers, right? and then you fix them, and then perform the inserts. All right. The second concept we talked about, which was important, was a perfect hash. Right? This is assuring that you're going to have essentially no collisions. Right? Doing this is not easy. Right, but given our randomization scheme for a universal hash, we can, in fact, right, find a perfect hash without too much trouble. Right? In this approach here, we do so at the expense of space, that is, we select a really large hash table, that is, the number of inserts squared. Right? If we select our hash table to be that large, and we randomly choose a hash function, such as using one of these two previous methods, Right? the probability that there will be no collisions is actually greater than 50-50. Right? So that's not bad. Right? This, of course, comes at the cost of extra space. So in a perfect world, we might want a perfect, we might want a perfect hash with linear space. Right? But here, we can, get a, we can get a perfect hash using quadratic space. Right? If the number of inserts isn't too big, this may be practical. If the number of inserts is very large, this is probably not going to be practical. All right. Lastly, we talked about some collision resolution schemes. All right. We looked at some probing or annexing approaches. All right. And then we looked at some chaining approaches. Right. The idea of chaining right, is very versatile in that it allows for dynamic size. And so once we pick a size of a hash table, right, we can, in a sense, continue to insert even if our table is full and or if we're getting some number of collisions in each hash bucket. Right. So in this particular instance here, right, we had three collisions in the second bucket, but we're able to chain them out. So this implementation here is a hash table of linked lists. Right. That is, we simply have an array of linked lists Right, where we use a hash function to index into that array. And I'll say that again. Right, this implementation here shows simply an array of linked lists where we're using a hash function to index into that array. And this is a hash table of linked lists. And using a similar scheme, right, we noted that we can get Right, a perfect hash in linear space as follows. So this is the best case scenario, and this is an algorithm to do it. This is what you should shoot for in your, in your projects. Right? This is your goal. This is an algorithm you can use. You can try some other algorithm if you like, right? or you can just try to, you know, again, magically pull a hash function out of a hat that works really well for our data set. Right? That would be okay. Although we will be testing it on multiple data sets, so having a more universal scheme right, is probably 
uh, and going to be more robust for different data sets. So how can we use it? Right? How can we find a perfect hash using only a linear amount of space? Right? Previously, we had to use a very large right, a very large hash table, which was quadratic in size. How do we do it? Well, we use the chaining approach. That is, rather than having a hash table of just singleton buckets, right, we go one step further than using chaining. Right? In chaining, we have a hash table of linked lists. Right? In this approach, we have a hash table of hash tables. Wow. Right? So that is, in a sense, we're chaining out our hash table with other hash tables. So what's the idea here? Well, first, simply create a universal hash of linear size, of size k. Right? This is going to result in some collisions, sure. Right? If we're extremely lucky, we might not, right? in which case, we'll be done. Note here, and something to note here, that if you're ever going to check to see whether there are collisions, right, you're going to have to just check. Right? That is, iterate through all the number of insertions and see if there's a collision. Right? So this is some time complexity associated with building the hash. Right, something to keep in the back of your minds. Right, building a good hash table and a hash function right, can take a lot of time, but the idea is that you spend a lot of time building it the first time, but then all subsequent uses of that hash table right, will be really fast. All right, so after you build this one hash table randomly, which has linear size, you're gonna have some number of collisions. Right? But then for each one of the bins, Right, remember, you have hash tables of hash tables. For each one of the bins, you're going to create a hash function using the quadratic space approach. Right. Right, so that is the hash table of hash tables. Right, the innermost hash table is going to be right, a hash table, the universal hash, right, the perfect hash right, chosen using your quadratic approach or the quadratic approach we talked about. Note here that this is going to, again, give you a hash function that has no collisions more than 50% of the time. Note here that this is the quadratic space approach, though. So how is this linear? Well, note here that this is only being performed on the hash buckets where there were collisions. So what does that mean? Well, this k squared, k here, is simply the number of collisions in that particular bucket. Right? Again, since we uniformly right, used a uni universal hash function for the original table, right, the number of collisions in each bucket should not be very big. This should be fairly small. Right? And in fact, we can show that the sum of the total number of collisions can be indeed bounded linearly by n, where n is the total number of insertions, right, n or k. The result Right, is that although we're using quadratic space for the number for each collision, right, for the buckets with collisions, right, the total space required is indeed linear. All right, so that's again the theory, and this is I think what what I wanted to point you guys to, right, uh, to get to get the ball rolling, to get you guys thinking about your project. All right, next and really to to get you guys really started. Right, we'll talk about the, the data type you guys are using, and that is the string. Right. So in, right, in our spell check, you guys are going to be building right, your lexicon, which is right, a dictionary of words or strings. Right. Building a hash table for something like a char is pretty easy. Right, that is, we have each char is represented using seven or eight bits. So you're going to have 128 or 256 right, unique characters to store. Right? So how can we generalize this for a string? Well, a string is simply a sequence of characters. Right? And so given the sequence of characters, right, we simply just have a sequence of ints. Right? And so there's a lot of things you can do with this as a sequence of chars is there's a direct correspondence right to a character from a character to an int. And so you should use this direct correspondence right, within right, to, to your advantage. Right? 
right? That is, many of these numerical approaches right, require some sort of arithmetic on integers to map these integers to a, a reasonable index set. Right? Since these characters already are integers, right, performing this mapping or coming up with a function to perform this mapping should not be too difficult. Right, again, one approach here right, could be that you could right, take your binary representation of the string right, right, and take the modulus of 100. Right. Is that the best idea in the world? No, probably not. Right. But it's, it is something you can certainly try and just see how bad it is. Right. Uh, another thing you could do is take each of the characters. So for example, right, let's say that you have the character Let's say you have this string, uh, Bob. Right, sorry, my uh, screen's a little bit, uh, it's having trouble rendering, right? So let's say that Bob, what's, what's the B in ASCII? Is it 30s, 40s, is that 50, like 50, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, maybe 54. Oops, let's clear that off, all right. All right, so let's say again, we'll uh, go ahead and drop Bob here, right? And Bob and ASCII, we'll just simply say that this could be just a sequence of ints where B is 54, let's say, right? O would then be, I'm gonna just estimate and do some quick arithmetic here, it would be maybe like 67, right? And then B would be 54. All right, so we can represent this string Bob as a sequence of integers, right? 54, 67, or 54, right? A sequence of integers or a vector of integers or something like this, right? And so using these numbers, we could, I don't know, add up each of these numbers, right? We could multiply them each times a random number, such as in some of our hash, uh, universal hash schemes, right? Again, the idea here is to use these numbers, right, to your advantage, Right, that is, use them to find a reasonable mapping right, to an in index set. All right. Well, that's all I wanted to cover right, for our lecture today. I wanted to make sure you guys right, make sure that number one, we got through that heap, uh, the heap examples, right, and we clarified the worst case runtime of Heapify. And I also wanted you guys to have a few ideas with respect to where to get started with your hash project. And I encourage you to think of each string as a sequence of ints, right? And go from there. I encourage you to try universal hash as it will allow you to potentially get to a perfect hash or an efficient hash more quickly, right? Than random trial and error. And again, I want you to set your goal at finding a perfect hash in linear space. And so I want that to be a goal of yours. Right? If you have to resort to using a quadratic method or something of this sort, it's not a problem. But I want that to be a goal of yours to come up with a perfect hash. Right? Generally speaking, one that will work in a general sense on any input, a perfect hash in linear space. And as you guys have seen, and right, in the rubric, points are allocated to the efficiency of your approach. And so if you build a perfect hash and it's in linear space, it will be fast and you will get many points for that portion of the rubric. Right? If you build something that's slightly less optimal, it's likely that it is going to be slower and it's likely that the points allocated for that portion of the rubric will be lower as well. All right, guys. Well, I'll go ahead and let you get to it, right? Get, uh, get back to your hash project, right? And I will see you at the end of break. All right, again, travel safely and enjoy Thanksgiving.